Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to yet another episode of our RSM COVID series for health professionals and by health professionals. It's the best lunch guest you'll ever have. Interesting, informed, and we never outstay our welcome. We start on time and we will finish at precisely one. So today, it's all about obstetrics. Before you ask, no, I don't know anything about it. I belong to the generation of medical students who are allowed to actually deliver babies. So I delivered 20, but that ended my association with obstetrics forever, except for two later events leading to two sons. Fortunately, we have two people today who I think have delivered slightly more babies than me over their careers. First of all, Dr. Maggie Blott, consultant obstetrician, head of obstetrics at the Royal Free, star of the BBC Hospital series. Um, which I have noticed nearly all of the Royal Free Hospital website is devoted to. So you will see her picture there and everywhere. Also author of the day-to-day -day pregnancy book, Count Down Your Pregnancy Day by Day, available in all good bookshops still, which are now open. And then Pat O'Brien, consultant, Obson Guiney at UCLH, vice president of the RCOG, that's Maggie Hill, I think, as I recall, and also very importantly, one of the authors of the superb BMJ study just out now, the National Study of All Confirmed COVID uh, Pregnancies. Now, so with the Royal Free and UCL so well represented, in fact, we're doing an outside broadcast today from the middle of a rain swept Regent's Park. Right, off we go. Pat, would you like to kick off for me and um, perhaps just explain, you know, why, why we're all so keen with, with the, um, the perinatal epidemiology study on COVID women? And uh, in, in an era where we're always saying how rubbish we are preparing for pandemic, this was one thing that actually was prepared and shows its worth in gold. Over to you, Pat. Yes, I think our big worry about pregnant women was that they would be affected to a greater extent than other people. So we knew, for example, from swine flu, H1N1, that it seemed to affect pregnant women in other groups, so that, uh, much worse than other people. So we we're really keen to see the data. Uh, and this study from UCOS, the UK Obstetric Surveillance uh, Service, it uh, included 400 and, 400 odd, 427 women admitted to hospital who were COVID positive. And I think overall the results have been, the findings have been very reassuring. So around 10% of women required uh, ventilation, level three uh, intensive care, and that's similar to the general population. Um, five women died, that's about less than 1%, um, not necessarily all from COVID, of course. Um, 5% of babies tested positive for COVID uh, in the and half of those in the, in, the, in the first 12 hours, and all of those did very well. And so, very, so a lot of reassuring data. I think the take home message, uh, number one, was that uh, this infection still, as far as we can tell, does not seem any worse for pregnant women than it is for anybody else. Now, one of the uh, other features that, that stuck out is that 56%, over half of the women admitted, were from a BAME, BAME background. Very concerning and very much in keeping with the findings uh, in the rest of the population. Uh, and also two thirds roughly had comorbidities uh, and roughly two thirds were obese. Okay, now you, I mean, the first thing to, to um, remember is this was planned after the swine flu epidemic, wasn't it? And then it was kind of put on ice, ready to be activated when needed. And, and, and the systems worked, it was a bacteria when needed. So this is a wonderful example of foresight in planning for, you knew that this was going to be necessary sooner or later. Is that about right? I think that's about right. I remember the, the, the reason that uh, UCOS exists is to, is to monitor sort of uh, rare but serious outcomes. So their whole model is set up to look at things like this, but you're absolutely right. Uh, this uh, this um, model had been sitting on the shelf, ready to be dusted off as soon as the pandemic arrived, which it, which it duly did. Yeah, well, I genuinely chapeau, as they say, it's like to everyone involved and uh, really remarkable. Now, you, you, you mentioned that five women died uh, uh, in, well, not in, as a result, well, in childbirth with COVID. Can you say, because people will immediately, you know, uh, grasp that or, or wonder, can you say a little bit more about that, um, if you if you can, if, if you're able to, I don't know whether you are or aren't, but is there something more you can say about the causes? Yes, I think an important point is that this whole study looked at women admitted to hospital who were COVID positive. Now that does not mean that they were admitted due to COVID infection. They might have come in in labour, had a bit of a temperature, had a swab, and there that came back positive. So completely unrelated to their admission, uh, and that also relates to the women that died. Now. 
I cannot talk about the women who died in great detail because it's, a, it's such a small number, thankfully, um, that giving details would actually identify who they were. But I think it's fair to say that the, the same principle applies, that I think we'll find that of the small number of women who died, uh, at least some were not, were not due to COVID directly. Okay. And although we hear fortunately little about this because it's such a rare event, it's not unheard of. It, I mean, it doesn't not to happen for women to die in, in childbirth. And would that rate be roughly what you would expect in, in a non-COVID year? It seems to be more or less what we would expect. Um, one thing worth noting is that you know, of course, that a thromboembolism, pulmonary embolism is a major cause of uh, maternal death. Mm -hmm. And there's all this information coming out over the last couple of months about how uh, this infection, this virus may well be uh, an endothelial problem. It may be a, 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 something that significantly increases the risk of VT. So the one important question for us to answer specifically in relation to pregnant women is how these two things interact. Okay. It's lovely of you, it's sweet of you to say, as you know, I obviously <laughs> don't know. But fortunately, Martin, you're here, you do know. So Maggie, do you, have any, do you want to say a bit more about um, the general experience of child, child, childbirth during the year of COVID, given you, know, you are doing this day in, day out? Yes, thank you, Simon. We, um, we, we knew that COVID-19 was coming and we, we made preparation for it, including um, we're learning how to put on, put off um, PPE and how we were going to change our operating procedure to try and accommodate the changes that would be needed for, for uh, COVID-19, but nothing quite prepares you uh, for what we, nothing quite prepared us for what we experienced. And there were so many areas to cover. One, one of the things that I think affected women most, um, most severely was the, the fact that we couldn't allow partners into the maternity unit. Now I've spent my whole career working and trying to get partners involved in the process of childbirth and worked overseas for, for several years and trying to do the same thing because we recognize how important it is. And yet we were seriously having to consider the possibility that partners, birth partners might not be allowed in to the birthing, to the labor ward. Fortunately, we were able to accommodate um, partners in the, birthing, in the birthing room, but not in the postnatal ward. So once women had had their babies and were transferred to the postnatal ward, the partners had to go home. And that was simply because of the need to socially distance. And you, can, you cannot socially distance four women and four men in a four bedded bay. And I think for some women that was so distressing um, that thought they couldn't have their partners around with them. And we did see a spike in incidents, a, a spike of requests rather for home births around that time and I think that was partly in, in response to the fact that partners couldn't be around very often. We did allow, um, and this is the same for many, many maternity units, um, facilitate husband partners coming into the uh, operating theatre if the, if the woman was having a planned caesarean section. Of course it was not always possible to facilitate a birth partner present in the operating theatre if it was for an emergency caesarean section. I mean it, it does sound you know, one could almost say health and safety gone mad. You, you allow them during the, the birth, which is a messy, uh, complex, dramatic experience. All sorts of things happen, can go wrong, etc. But in the kind of, not exactly peace, but in the more controlled environment of the postnatal ward, um, you can't. Do, do, you, do you regret that now? Do you think that was perhaps overzealous or not? Well, not really. If we're going to, if social distancing is important, then that was the that was the rate limiting step of allowing partners into the postnatal ward. So on the labour ward, the, the women would come up, be triaged, and their partners would then come up from security and would join them and spend all the time with them on the labour ward. Because of course, when women in labour are on a single room mm. with ensuite bathroom facilities. The partners were not encouraged to leave the room, certainly weren't encouraged to wander around the hospital, but were, were able to stay in the birthing room. But simply, if you have, we have a 31 bedded postnatal ward, if you have 31 postnatal women and 30, 31 partners, that's an awful lot of people. And then you include the staff in that, it's quite a lot of people to self to be able to self-isolate in that way. And of course, at the time we weren't doing routine testing of all 
in, for admissions. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't testing partners, so we didn't, and we know that a lot of people carry this virus and are asymptomatic, uh, and that's been shown to be true in pregnancy as well. So it was saddened me a lot, but I understood the logic of it. Um, as we introduced routine testing for COVID on admission, that we made it easier to be able to cohort groups of women into different areas and allow partners to be present. Uh, and that's what's... Are you doing that now or is that for the future? We're just starting. So the recommendation is now from the Royal College that all women admitted to a plan for admission uh, into a maternity service plus their partners are tested. We're just trying to operationalize it because logistically that is quite a hard thing to do. Um, and then once we've once we've admitted them, tested them, we then may need to keep them safe. So women who are COVID negative need to be put into areas where we can COVID protect them and so on and so forth. So logistically, it's quite hard work. I was going to bring this in later, but already uh, one of the questions is addressing this question of social distancing from Sarah Johnson. Uh, and is asking really the same question, but you know, at the moment, I assume that it's very difficult for people to attend NCT classes, antenatal, postnatal, um, all the, I'm sorry about the uh, ring, um, all, all the various things that, that people do, even I can remember, after birth, which are so important to social support and getting you through both as a mother and as a family, you know, the pretty difficult postnatal period. How's yeah. the, hasn't that been affected then by, by the same rules? Yes, yeah, so um, a lot of the post, lot of um, teaching, uh, uh, childbirth, um, support, teaching, education, all those sort of things went online. And I know many, many units put resources online. Um, and that was very popular actually, because women didn't really want to come to the hospital anyway. They were very happy to have access to breastfeeding support and um, antenatal classes education online. And that was well received. In terms of antenatal care, a lot of it was done virtually. So we adopted a lot of hospitals certainly my own unit adopted to telephone consultations where safe to do so. Um, but of course, antenatal care is basically a screening tool for, mm. for development of complications. And so we therefore had to continue to be able to mm. measure blood pressures, dip urine, measure um, the size of the uterus and ensure the baby was growing properly. And that cannot be done remotely. So we had to maintain services. We tried to, um, Make, do, this, do the service provision logically. So if a woman needed a blood test and a scan, we try and fit in a consultation at the same time. So that limiting the number of women that had to come up. And, um, and it, on the whole, it worked well. I think the one area where it may not work quite so well was in, was in more vulnerable women. So women, yeah. women with, um, um, by the domestic violence, and we know that probably has gone up during COVID, and shut lockdown, uh, women with safeguarding issues, women with drug and alcohol problems may not be so well supported via a telephone consultation. No, and I'm obviously thinking of postnatal depression as well, mm -hmm. uh, issues right, like yeah. that, in which is the social interaction that is so important. Yeah. Okay, let's, let, let's uh, move on then. Now, we talked a little bit about the risk to the mother, but the obvious next question is uh, about the risk uh, to, to the baby. What do we know about the risk of babies born to COVID positive mothers? Now, who wants to start? Pat, do you want to kick off? Sure. Um, I think the bottom line is that the risk seems to be very low indeed. Um, first question is, can the infection transfer from mother to baby across the placenta in the yeah. womb or during childbirth? Um, we think probably yes. I mean, there's been a number, a small number of babies around the world, including in the UCOS uh, paper, uh, less than 5% that have been po tested positive in the sort of hours and days after birth. Now, of course, they might have picked up the infection after birth. That's possible, um, for, even from a member of staff rather than from their mother. There have been a very small number of babies who were in cord blood or their own blood soon after birth. They've been identified the IgM against this virus. And we know that IgM... Um, um, uh, does not cross the placenta in contrast to IgG. So this would really suggest um, that these babies had developed a sort of immune response against the virus while still in the uterus. Having said that, the test for IgM, especially at low levels, has a lot of cost cross reactivity. Um, so I think where we are at the moment is, number one, it seems likely or possible at least that the infection, the virus does get across to the baby. But it seems, even if it does, it seems to be a very small proportion of babies. 
And none of those babies, as far as we can tell, have been seriously affected by the infection. So Peter Board, one of our stalwarts on this series, basically you're saying there's been no evidence of an increased number of babies requiring post, um, uh, either, either being born prematurely or requiring neonatal intensive care. You've not, you've not seen an increase in that. What we have seen, well, what we have not seen is, an, as you say, an increase in babies requiring ventilation. Yep. What, we have not, what we have not seen is an increase in spontaneous preterm labor in women who have this infection. What we have seen, though, is an increase in, a small increase in the number of women being delivered early because they've come into hospital with significant infection themselves. And it was felt that in order to treat the mother more efficiently, it was better to deliver the baby. So that, that's definitely an increase. Right. Okay, so that, that us is a different response. Okay. Okay, so moving on then. So babies have been born and the general guidance is for breastfeeding. And uh, then obviously the question is, what should the advice be for breastfeeding when we know the mother is COVID positive? I, I did look at the WHO on this one just to ask and they were, uh, well, they said uh, whether or not that should happen should be determined by the mother in coordination with her family and the healthcare provider. Now that's normally a euphemism for we haven't a clue. <laughs> Is that true? Do we not have a clue? Well, we know that, um, well, I hate to say we didn't have a clue, but I suspect we, we weren't far off that. We, we didn't know. So we did what, was, what we thought what was best, which is try to keep mothers and babies together. We know that separating mothers and babies at birth is very detrimental to both. Yep. So in an otherwise well mother and an otherwise well baby, um, we used we kept mother and baby together. We know or we think we know that the virus is not present in breast milk, therefore there was no reason not to breast milk. And we put in standard and sensible precautions in terms of hand washing and wearing a face mask when women were breastfeeding their babies. Um, and we've so, and we've encouraged we've encouraged breastfeeding to continue. Obviously, there was need at some times for babies and mothers to be separated. And that's another unintended consequence of this virus is that when babies were admitted to the neonatal unit, special care baby unit or neonatal intensive care unit, many units weren't allowing um, their parents to visit because again of the risk of, of transmitting virus to staff and all babies. And there were lots of clever things that were put in place to keep families in touch by using iPads and and messages from the baby and that sort of thing. But it's very distressing for mothers not to be able to visit their babies when their babies were admitted into the NICU for very good reasons. They're all justifiable, but I, I fear that we will see some longer term consequences or we may see some longer term consequences of that. Yes, uh, will, will that, um, Patrick, taking you back to your study, will your, your study continue to look at issues like that, the immediate postnatal outcomes, even developmental trajectories of, the, of these babies? Yeah, absolutely. And as you can imagine, there are studies uh, going on all over the world into all these uh, aspects. Um, one of the studies that the RCOG, in, in collaboration with uh, our colleagues at King's, are setting up is a is look at the sort of three cohorts, uh, three um, sort of epochs, really, time, time periods of four months each. One last year before the, this all kicked off, uh, one during the pandemic and another one perhaps later in this year or early new year and comparing all of these outcomes through during these uh, three epochs and we're looking at not just uh, things conditions that we think are a direct result of uh, the virus but also uh, things health outcomes that are a result of maybe the changes that we've uh, that have taken place to the services that we provide Maggie was talking about the changes to antenatal care for example um, and also the kind of those other effects such as you know, anecdotal reports of women being reluctant to come to hospital with reduced fetal movements because they're afraid of catching the infection in the hospital or because through altruistic uh, intentions, they, they, they don't want to overburden a system that they know is already stretched. So it'll be really interesting um, and helpful, I think, moving forward to look at uh, outcomes for both mother and baby uh, in the longer term. Okay, so good to have a plug for RCOG, good to have a plug for Kings, uh, but also Sharon Famingetti is reminding we should also have a quick plug for NCT, who are indeed also running online courses, so happy to do so. Now, you, you, you just there uh, dropped a hint that, that people, there's evidence that women uh, were less likely to attend with, uh, did you say, reduced fe fetal movement? 
um, because of fear of getting infected. I mean, this brings us on to a much wider topic, and it's obviously not unique to obstetrics, but I mean, I was kind of thinking that obstetrics wouldn't have been much involved in this kind of issue. Of, I think it's sometimes called collateral damage. I mean, whatever you do, childbirth is going to happen. It's going to happen at the same time as it always has done, and there's not much that's going to change about that. But apparently, this isn't true. There's been quite a good evidence of the the unexpected or unintended consequences um, in obstetrics of, of, of what's been going on, on on services and care. Mags, do you want to kick off on that one? Sure. Um, a lot of the work that we do is um, is prevention, and a lot of patients, a lot of women that we see who turn up for uh, at the hospital as an emergency, have concerns around abdominal pain, uh, reduced fetal movements all sorts of things, a lot of it not concerning, but some of it very concerning. And a lot of the work we do is seeing and looking after those women. During the peak of the pandemic, that group of women completely disappeared. We, 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 saw, we went for days, we'd seen only single figures of women of presenting for um, reduced fetal movements or bleeding in pregnancy or indeed even early pregnancy so rates of miscarriage women turning up with early miscarriages ectopic pregnancies all those numbers fell and so it's a concern that women as pat said were keeping themselves away from the hospital because of concerns and we don't yet know whether there'll be long-term consequences of an increase in stillbirth or an increase increase in growth restricted babies because we weren't able to pick them up um, and that's something we're going to need to watch very carefully. Those numbers, I'm pleased to say, have started to pick up now. So women are they, now, have. they have, yeah. Not, not necessarily the same as before, but they're certainly, we're seeing an almost increase back to normal service business as usual. But that's about two months where women were not coming to the hospital when normally they would have done so. And of course, you're both gynecologists as well. Um, have, is this the case for um, gynecological cancers as well? Does anyone know that? Do you have any information on that, Pat? Yes, I think in terms of operating uh, on gynae cancer, that has continued pretty much unaltered through the pandemic. Uh, as you know, the NHS has taken over a lot of private healthcare facilities and a lot of the gynae cancer has continued there. Um, what has probably suffered and to a great deal is the diagnosis size of things. So women not going to their GP for their routine cervical smear test. Mm. Uh, when they've had a cervical smear test that's abnormal, a delay in getting through for colposcopy. So, our, for example, our colposcopy services at UCLH are getting up and running now. But because of social distancing, the number of women that we can see in the day there is probably about half or a third of what we could see in the past. So even now, trying to get back to normal and catch up with that backlog is difficult. And I think there will be consequences. Okay. Now, Yulia, lovely Russian name, I think, uh, Yulia Ashton, is asking, you mentioned that you pushed a lot of things onto, into the digital space in terms of antenatal care, et cetera. Do you think that in future, those incredibly huge crowded waiting rooms uh, of, 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 seem to characterize antenatal care around the globe, do you think that that's going to be a thing of the past now? You'll, you've learned to target on the smaller number you really need to see? I hope so. I, I hate the crowded antenatal clinic room. Really very, very distressing for everybody, including the staff trying to see large numbers of women. And what, what I've certainly learned is that I can do a lot of counselling over the phone uh, or, or if better still get um, the, the screen working as well. Because a lot of the reasons I see women in pregnancy is to counsel them about, for example, mode of delivery. Should they have another caesarean section or should they go for a, a trial of labour? or to discuss um, some other complication that they've had and how to cancel them. That doesn't necessarily need to be with a, uh, it, within a complex and busy antenatal clinic. So while there will still need to be a minimum number of visits that women are re require in terms of monitoring blood pressure growth, and stuff, I think we can, we can start to think about doing business in a different way, which will be more convenient for, for, for women than having to come up to a hospital and sit in a busy antenatal clinic for two hours. Can I pick up on that as well, Simon? So, you know, what we really need to do, is, as Maggie said earlier, is put in place mitigation to all of this. So, for example, uh, blood pressure monitoring is a, is a really important thing. And that's probably the main reason why the antenatal visits increase in frequency towards the end is to watch out for this. 
No, and it, through this pandemic, NHS England made a, quite a lot of money available for providing home blood pressure monitors for women. Um, there are, you know, information leaflets or apps from mobile phone app that can monitor, that can sort of instruct women. They basically they take their blood pressure at home, even test their urine, plug the results into this app on their phone, and the app says you're fine or you're not fine. Recheck it in an hour or go to the hospital. So you know, it may be not as good as coming to the hospital for a blood pressure check, or maybe better because you know this white white coat hypertension is significantly reduced. The cost of the women are coming to the hospital. Etc. Etc. So, you know, we need to consider, as Maggie said, the risks of not having women coming to the hospital, but there are real potential benefits and a lot of mitigation that can be put in place. Okay, Anna Edwards has taken me to task for. Um, I'm sorry, Anna Edwards has taken me to task for describing childbirth as messy and dramatic. I think I spent too much time in the company of obstetricians like you, Maggie, because I didn't <laughs> get. But I'm sure that I'm sure that's grossly unfair. Now, uh, at least two people have asked a very, Sharon Stoneman and Sasha Massa before we went on air, both asked the same question. And now this is about healthcare professionals who are uh, pregnant. What, what is the advice now about um, what you should be doing, not doing, uh, et cetera, as a, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yes, if you're a healthcare professional who is pregnant, particularly in the first trim trimester, is there any specific advice or anything you should be doing? What's the college's position? Pat, do you do I pick that up? Okay. So the first thing is that every, every healthcare professional um, who is pregnant should go to a specific sort of risk analysis with, and that's the responsibility of the um, employer to do that with the oh, person. WHOE now, come on. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing is uh, up to, we've kind of been a, 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 an arbitrary division line at 28 weeks of gestation. So up to 28 weeks, um, it is reasonable for pregnant women, should they so wish, to continue working, although preferable to avoid patient facing um, uh, roles uh, and particularly avoiding those high risk situations like general anesthesia, for example, where we know there's an increased risk. After 28 weeks, the default would be uh, not to work in patient-facing uh, areas. Um, now, having said that, if a woman who's over 28 weeks pregnant and strongly wishes uh, to continue working, uh, then she should be supported in that, and the employer should put in place all the measures to, to mitigate the risk and minimize direct patient contact and certainly stay away from high-risk areas. Okay. Maggie, do you want to add to that? or? No, I'd agree with all that. I think there are obviously some women who are more at risk than others, so um, they particularly need to be advised to stay away. Um, and there are a lot of um, things that, that um, healthcare professionals can do that are non-patient facing. I think, uh, I think the only thing is we need to just consider when doctors in training are pregnant and are going to be not see patients for three or four months, how that will affect their training. And that just needs to be um, considered. Okay, so and so we, we're, we're coming to the end now. We're going to have to end because I've just noticed this is a name drop coming, but I've just had a missed call from Simon Stevens. So <laughs> you're not be on this webinar ever again after that. <laughs> God knows what that is. I shall have to find out. Okay, so for all of you whose question hasn't been addressed, don't worry. We'll have another go at the end of the month when we catch up on all the unended questions that we have, or unanswered questions, not unended questions. Um, that we have, so we maybe pick up a few of those then and there. And um, now, my thanks to Maggie and Pat uh, very much. Don't go away, because there's a couple of things I now need to say that um, the, this uh, RSM series is, of course, uh, run by the RSM, uh, as you know, and uh, any support that people are going to give to that would be very welcome uh, and also needed. Second, we will be back next week, of course, as we always do. On Tuesday, it's the turn of the journals to come under scrutiny, how they've been managing during COVID, what mistakes have they made, some fairly obvious ones, and what good things have they done. So we have B. Godley, Fiona Godley from the BMJ, and Howard Borcher, the editor of JAMA. And then on Thursday, we may go back a little bit to Oggs and Guiney, actually, because Professor Beverly Hunt, who I'm sure you both know, um, the World Authority on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, uh, from St. Thomas's, we will be doing uh, uh, the whole uh, session will be on thrombosis and hemostasis issues. So um, my thanks once again then to Maggie and to Pat for, a, 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 as I expected, a, a brilliant series. Do, do watch Maggie on TV, do buy her book, she needs the money. <laughs> <laughs> <Please>. <laughs>
<laughs> continue to support the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We finish on time. And uh, as we say at the end of Hill Street Blues, as ever, stay careful out there. Good afternoon. Thank you.